All right, this is an interview with Stephen Samboy, New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 22nd of March, 2004, uh, approximately 10.20 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, full name is Stephen with a P.H. Samboy. Uh, date of birth, 8-24-23. You want home address? No, where you oh, were born. Oh, I was born in uh, Queens, Astoria, Queens. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to high entering school. service? High school. You completed high school. Yeah, I completed high okay. school. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, actually, my older brother had just purchased a 1941 convertible Chevy and he took the family on a drive our area had a place known as it's still there, Astoria Park mm -hmm. and he took us on a drive uh, along the East River and we had just turned onto the East River Drive when the news come over of the attack at uh, Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. uh, we, we were shocked, but it, uh, it was a very, very difficult time. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Okay. Excuse me, I had a family of eight, eight kids. I was next to the oldest, so mm -hmm. <laughs> they needed the income. <laughs> now, were you working before? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where were you working? Uh, at the time that uh, I was drafted, I was working in deluxe labs. Uh, part of uh, 20th Century Fox. Uh, in fact, if you see a lot of the colored movies now, you'll see Color by Deluxe on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was working in the in the laboratory, which was a uh, uh, owned by uh, 20th Century Fox, mm -hmm. but okay. we operated more or less on a, our own basis. All right. uh, when did you, when were you inducted into the service? Do you recall? Uh, I think it, I was actually inducted on March the 3rd, and then we spent uh, about a week in uh, uh, Camp Upton in Long Island, and then uh, uh, went down to uh, Camp Butner, uh, North Carolina, uh, to start our service. I think that was March the 10th. Mm -hmm. Now, was this the first time you were really away from, ever away from home? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did yeah. you feel about that? Or? Well wasn't too happy about it, but mm -hmm. uh, I guess we were young enough and not brainy enough to really be afraid of anything mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. We came down, uh, had a pretty good sized group. The uh, group that uh, I went down with, uh, basically New Yorkers and uh, uh, men from New Jersey, and uh, they had just uh, sent all the privates overseas. So they uh, restocked the, the division with our people in uh, March of uh, uh, 43. Mm -hmm. and so you were assigned right away to the 78th division? Yeah, right to the 78th, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what kind of training did you receive? How long were you down there? Well, we had, we had basic training. In fact, very good. Uh, of course, I don't have the article, but uh, Life magazine gave us a big write-up on our uh, obstacle course and said the only obstacle course in the country that beats it was at uh, Camp Lejeune, mm -hmm. the Marine base. Mm -hmm. Of course, we were very proud of that. That uh, made it pretty good. But uh, our obstacle course actually had uh, uh, machine gun fire, uh, I think about three feet high, so mm -hmm. you, you had to crawl pretty low to get under the machine gun fire, but that was the end of the course. Uh, I was injured one time going over it. Uh, we had a cargo net about 20, 25 feet high uh, to simulate getting off a ship in a hurry. And one way or another, I, I fell off or was knocked off, and I ended up uh, breaking my elbow and then went into the hospital. But uh, our obstacle course was, was a pretty good one. Uh, and uh, we got pretty good training down there. We had about a, I think, a two or three week uh, maneuver in uh, South Carolina. And then in uh, the winter, in fact, we were the first winter 
maneuvers in Tennessee. Uh, from January to March, we maneuvered in Tennessee with the 106th Infantry Division. And then uh, after the maneuvers ended, they sent us to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia. And once again, everybody under a corporal was sent overseas. And at this point, they restocked the division with men out of ASTP, that was the Army Specialized Training Program. Young men, in those days, two of the men that we got, signed up to go to college to become superior officers after the war in the Army of Occupation. But at that point, I think the Army decided that uh, they weren't going to need all of those kids that, that were in college. Mm -hmm. So they took the kids out of ASTP. And these are boys who signed up not to go into the Marines or a fighting outfit. They went in to go to college. Mm -hmm. And they also stripped everyone <clears throat> below a certain status out of the Air Force uh, cadet training program. So uh, I received three men in, in our section. One was out of the cadets program, and the other two were ASTP. Uh, we had a reunion in Pittsburgh uh, in 02. We have a reunion every even year. And uh, in Pittsburgh, we had several of the men, uh, one of who has written several articles for our, our bulletin, who had been ASTP. And their whole complaint was that that was the absolutely the worst damn thing that could ever happen to anybody. Here you go into the army to go to college and become an army of occupation technician, and what the hell do they do? They take you out and set, send you to the infantry. But as I told uh, uh, a couple of the men, as far as I was concerned, I, I think it probably was uh, one of the best things that ever happened to our division. And I think that uh, it was one of the reasons that the division did so well because you had uh, a very large group of uh, ambitious and dedicated men that they came in, and most of them had to have pretty good IQs. They weren't uh, just the ordinary civilian. Mm -hmm. uh, we had had some men that had been with us in the earlier parts, and like, one of them didn't wear shoes till he <laughs> got a job, and. Some of them really came from uh, pretty uh, low uh, economic life. But with this group, we really received some highly trained people. Mm -hmm. uh, the three men that we received into our radio section uh, were absolutely excellent. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, in fact, probably one of the real uh, compliments happened. We stopped in Strauk for two days. Uh, just before we moved out to capture the Swam Emanuel Dam and, and Schmidt. And while we were in Strauch, we received two passes to London, three-week passes, which was pretty good to get out of combat for three weeks. And Kennedy says to the company... Oh, who was Kennedy? Kennedy was the uh, battalion commander. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, Lyle Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy says to the company commander, he says, now we got two passes to London. He says, I really don't care who gets them as long as one of them is a radio man. Now, to me, that was an absolute uh, compliment for, mm -hmm. for, for our people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I have a letter. I don't know if it's in. in no, 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 where did you receive your extra the, uh, radio training? Well, I, uh, I went to division radio school uh, for two months. Mm -hmm. uh, I came out second in the class there. And then uh, I was one of the uh, two men from the regiment that was sent down to uh, Fort, Benning, Fort Benning Infantry School for three months. And that, that was a pretty good assignment. Uh, in fact, uh, it was fall when we were there. And I don't know if you're a football fan and go that far back, but Bob Waterfield, who was one of the top All-Americans, when he got into Fort Benning and became an officer, he naturally became part of Fort Benning's football team. And his wife, Jane Russell, used to come watch the game sometime. And you'd look at the stadium and you couldn't possibly find any room to put anybody in. By the time she walked by, there were seats all over the place. 
<laughs> sit here, Jane, sit here. And she used to walk in with her a fur cape thrown over her shoulder, looking for a spot to go to sit. But uh, to me, like Fort Benning was, was not really uh, uh, an army post. You had a, a theater there, you had uh, swimming pools, you had all types of facilities that we couldn't get in the ordinary camp, certainly didn't have them in Butler. But uh, the uh, school there was, was really very, very good, excellent. The, oh, could I go back a second? Did, yeah. did breaking your elbow hamper your training? At Not much, really, or? no. no. I, uh, I still have a chip in the elbow, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it knocked me off the police force in 1947 with DVP. I was number four out of 20,000, and the day I was to be sworn as, as a police officer, they spread eagled us, and the doctors took a look, and the one doctor says, hey, young fella, he says, why is that elbow so crooked? I said, I heard it in the army. So then they rushed me into x-ray, and when they saw the x-ray, the doctor says, well, he says, we can't take a chance on you. He says, you got bone chips between the tendon and the nerves in the elbow. Hmm. He says, you could be on a job two or three months, fall down, become uh, incapacitated, mm -hmm. he says, and you'd be out on pension for the rest of your life. He says, we can't, we can't take that chance. But aside from that, uh, mm -hmm. and, and no real problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the uh, injury prevented me from getting on the police force. So okay. actually, I guess that, that, that's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty hurt. Because if I had gone on the force in 1947 with the uh, New York City Police Department, you get out in 20 years, <laughs> that means yeah. I w would have been out as a pretty young man, but uh, in the end I took a job with civil service. Mm -hmm. They put me on a, on a, on a list of uh, other departments, but I ended up in civil service. I was with Consumer Affairs for about 10 or 11 years and then went to the, uh, to the New York State Liquor Authority. I was there about 22 years. Okay, now um, let's go back to after you, uh, now Jared were you ever close to Jane Russell? Did she ever sit next to you? <laughs> oh, no, no, I was never that lucky. I guess I might have been within 15 or 30 feet of her, but that's about as close as I ever got. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, after uh, you were there and received that training, where did you go? Well, then uh, after the uh, training at Fort Benning, I came mm -hmm. back Benning, to yeah. my uh, division spot and... Uh, by that time, I had been promoted to a T4 at the uh, sergeant with a T under a technician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like second in command in the radio section, so that uh, the radio chief was a, ma a staff sergeant and I was second in command under him. But uh, it, it was an experience at Fort Benning and uh, learned quite a bit. The, I guess you'd call him uh, commander of the radio school, had started with Western Union as a post hole digger. And at 60, they wanted him to come in and take over the infantry radio school in Fort Benning. He says, good, I'll become a colonel. He said, I'm sorry, we don't have any colonels in the signal corps. He said, well, if you want me, you got one. <laughs> and sure enough, they made him a colonel and, and he went in there. And at his age, because it was more of an action than anything, he used to take pride in taking a new class that had just entered before they started, and he would get up on a stage, or his, his desk was on a stage, and he'd stand on his head and one arm, and with the loose arm, he'd say, send the Morse code. And he says, now look, he says, if a man at my age can stand on his head and send code, he says, I don't ever want to hear any of you complain about having trouble sending code in the moving jeep. But he it, it was a remarkable individual. When you figure if he started as a post hole digger with Western Union and ended up an, an executive VP, that uh, had to be an unusual man. But uh, he had a good sense of humor. He, uh, one of the things he said, he says, well, gentlemen, he says, we are going to issue a lot of equipment 
tube check is this, that, and the other thing. He says, the only thing we're not going to give you is any electricity to operate it either. He says, good, you ain't going to have any electricity in the field. <laughs> so you could only use that equipment if you happened to, to be in a situation where you had uh, uh, power available. In the did combat, ever, of course, we used. Did you ever use those? Uh, the generator? generators? Yeah. The, uh, our big radio, uh, I call it a big radio, it's an AM, uh, our, uh, SCR 284, uh, you could operate it with a generator if it was out of a Jeep. Mm -hmm. The generator was like on a tripod with a seat, and mm -hmm. then you had to turn it, but you could produce enough power to, uh, to operate the set. So that uh, uh, was quite a thing. When we first went into this, uh, into combat, uh, the basic radio was the old uh, handy talkie. You'll see it in some of the old movies. It looks like about a cigarette carton and the olive drab green. Mm -hmm. uh, and that had a range of, uh, if you were lucky, up to a mile. Uh, they then issued us uh, six of the uh, 300s, which was a 40-pound FM radio. And uh, that way, each company commander and two for battalion headquarters had it. But I think that somebody in Washington had realized that the handy talkie was not usable in the in the service. So all of a sudden, they started to issue us almost uh, for no reason. Ran over a puddle, you lost two radios in the stream, you know. And uh, I, I would say after about a month in combat, we had thirty. Three uh, hundreds, so that way uh, each company would have enough to cover the company commander and and the platoon leaders. Now, how reliable were, were, was the equipment? And the three hundred was good. <coughs> the three hundred was good. The uh, I would say. Well, go ahead. Yeah. The only time I uh, really ever had any problem with it uh, in our uh, attack on Diedenborn, uh, we were on a uh, bald face of a hill with the Germans on the other side of the Roar, and Charlie Company had sent in two platoons. Uh, at that point, the Roar used to be about 15 or 20 feet wide and weightable, but with all the melting snow, it now had become almost 35 feet wide and mm -hmm. no weighting in there. Uh, out of the uh, two platoons of uh, C Company that went into the stream, I think 22 men and two officers got over to the other side and went up the hill and captured the uh, uh, village of Diedenborn, which, which was quite an accomplishment. They came, 20, 24 men came back with 43 prisoners, <laughs> and they said they counted over 30 dead. Yeah. So that had to be one hell of an outfit. And, mm -hmm. and the problem was that some of the men had lost their weapons in trying to get across the river. And uh, some of the men who actually attacked Diedenborn didn't have any more than trench knives or hand grenades. They had no rifles or BARs. But uh, some of the men were able able to hold on to their weapons and, and to take them into, into Diedenborn. And, uh, now with the radio equipment, were you able, did you ever repair a unit with you and were you able to repair them in the field? Uh, nah, no, uh, we never, never tried to repair it. Mm -hmm. One went dead, you just got a new one, that's all. So but uh, we never had that much problem with them. Mm -hmm. You but got rid of the old one, just threw it out? But no, no, we sent, we sent it back oh, to the regiment. To the yeah, it went back to regiment mm -hmm. and, and probably to signal corps for repair. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, at, at our but stage, you didn't repair them oh no, we never attempted it. Okay. What's the biggest problem, them getting wet? Uh, I guess it, you could have a problem if they got wet, but we, we wore them through rainstorms and snowstorms and never had any difficulty with it. As far as I was concerned, that was a very, very excellent piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, in waiting there uh, in Diedenborn, we were on a open side of a hill in, with Captain Collins, Charlie Company, and his men were the ones who captured Diedenborn. And at that point, I wanted to get get messages back to battalion headquarters. But we were down in the val valley and my uh, batteries were probably about 18 hours old. They usually were good only for about 24. Uh, and they had a, FM has a tendency of not being able to bounce over hills. 
So I was lucky enough to contact an operator from uh, uh, D Company, our heavy weapons. He was sitting on the edge of the uh, cliff looking down into the roar and he acted as an intermediary between myself and uh, battalion headquarters. And uh, Harry Hurley was on the set. He was one of our three men that came in. He came from the Air Force. Harry was on the set in battalion headquarters. I could hear him because the signal would fall over the cliff and down into the valley. But he couldn't hear me. But the operator from D Company could hear me, and he'd relay the messages back. Of course, Harry being overly cautious, he would not accept the message if I could not code it. Because we're sitting on the bald side of a hill, ain't no way we're going to strike a match or nothing else. So Harry, in his wisdom, he says, all right, ask him what language his father spoke. So I answered Ukrainian. He says, okay. And then later on, I sent another message. He says, okay, ask him what big city he was born in. I told him a story, and of course, he knew that. But uh, it, it was an unusual experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the odd thing, coming back, after we uh, left the cliffs, uh, we had myself, the battalion commander, and the uh, artillery uh, uh, forward observer with his operator. The four of us walked back to uh, battalion headquarters, and we got into the uh, compound there, into the town, and one of the uh, staff officers asked us which way we came. So I told him, I said, you know, I said, we weren't exactly sure where we were. Uh, we tried to remember the terrain, I said, and we came up through this valley and up there. He says, well, he said, thank God it was so cold. He says, you don't know it, he says, but you travel, travel through one of the worst minefields in the area. Okay. But he says, because the ground was so frozen, the mines couldn't uh, detonate. Uh, at that point, what the Germans used mostly is, uh, we gave it a nickname of Bouncing Betty. Mm -hmm. uh, if you trip the uh, uh, mine device, the mine used to come out about two feet out of the ground and then explode. Because anyone near it lost his, his legs at least, you know. But uh, it, it was a very, very, very bad uh, weapon as far as we were concerned. But in that case, we were lucky that the ground was cold enough that none of them could come up. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you go over to Europe? Uh, we went over, uh, I think it was October of uh, 43. 43 or 44? Oh, 44. October of 44. We stayed in London for a while, then we went to France for a while. Uh, we stayed in Belgium uh, in a little village before we moved into combat. We were, I guess, about 35 miles from the front at that point in Belgium. And uh, one of the unusual situations, we were scheduled to pitch pup tents in the, the courtyard of this little house in a town called Oper Overapen. Of course, the people from the house came out and said, well, there's no sense of you guys trying to live out there, first week in December, no sense of you guys living out there on the ground, we said, we, we don't sleep in the house, so if you want to go into the house, you can. Uh, they were in the, under the direct path of the bus bombs that were on their way to London. And the bombs every once in a while had a habit of running out of fuel, and they would come down. So nobody in, in that area lived in the house itself. Everybody lived in the basement. They moved all their furniture down, and the house upstairs was just bare wooden floors. Uh, for us, it was much better to throw your fart sack on the wooden floor than it was on a muddy ground outside in the courtyard. So, and we had become extremely friendly with that family. Uh, the night before we left, the grandmother, the grandfather, uh, the daughter, Marie, who was 32 at the time, her husband, and uh, one of the other, uh, uh, her sister, and uh, Marie's two children, they prayed all night long for the six of us. And it's another story, but it's one of the few black Madonnas that you'll find in the world. But for some reason, the Madonna of Tongres is a black Madonna. 
and they, she, she still had it when we went back to see her in 85, but uh, the uh, family prayed for us. And later on I checked, and as far as I could find out, there wasn't another radio section in the whole division that didn't lose a man, other, aside from ah six men that had never even been scratched. Dave one time had a piece of shrapnel, he was sitting at a window in a building with the radio on the windowsill, a piece of shrapnel tore the 300 to pieces but didn't hit Dave. And Joe Grimaldi one time was in a foxhole, a big foxhole, and the kid with him was killed. And he wasn't scratched. I've used that as a, a, a lesson, a power of prayer, and what, what can happen. I have pictures of the family if you wanted to see them. But we went back in 1985. We had a division association tour of the uh, battlegrounds, and we tried to go to the places that we had been. And we went back to see her then. Uh, actually, was, we were staying at a Holiday Inn in the Liege uh, overnight. And the next day, we were going to take off uh, into Germany. But we had tried to find Marie, and we went into town, and nobody could find her, didn't know where she lived. So finally, we went to the church, and there was an old priest in his mid-70s. He says, well, he says, uh, I can tell you where she lives. He says, I don't think she'll be home. He says, but I'll send you to her sister. So we went to her sister's house, and the sister said, no, Marie and her husband are in town. You won't see them today, you know. Uh, we never got to see her in the morning because then we went back and we went into our tour. I came back to the hotel at night for dinner about 9.30. The MC gets on the mic, he says, we want to talk to Sergeant Sam, boy. <laughs> what the hell they want to talk to me about, you know? So I went up to him and he says, we have a man here who wants to take you back to see Marie. Mm -hmm. It's about 10 o'clock at night. So he took us in his car and drove us back to Overapen, I guess about 15 or 20 miles. And then we were invited in and met Marie. Now she had a new husband, huh? original husband, the one we had met, had passed away. But the old, uh, new husband said, he says, you know what's funny, he says, because all of these years Marie has been telling us that her boys were going to come back, you know. He says, we didn't believe her, but he says, here you are. And uh, in the house uh, she was visiting was a girl from Oklahoma. She was on an exchange student uh, a situation. So she was studying in a university in Belgium and one of the Belgian students was at the University of Oklahoma. And I uh, got pictures of her too, but a uh, nice kid. But uh, the return at that time was really something. Uh, it, you know, you figure you go back and uh, 40 years later and, and find people like that. In fact, uh, Dave, no, we don't know what course, but Dave hired a bus to take us on a tour the last day we had in, in Germany, just before we uh, went home, we left on Monday. But th that Sunday he hired a bus, and then we went around to the different places, looking for the different places where we had lived. And the bus driver, who was a young kid, about 22 or 23, I guess, spoke English very well. and. He says, you've got to be crazy. He says, how do you think you're going to come back 40 years later and be able to find the places where you had been? Well, we went to Fulda, which was a, a big city. And uh, at that point, I couldn't get over the amount of armor that was in Fulda. I talked to one of the tankers, and he says, well, he says, there are only two main roads that the Russians can use to come into Germany in any strength. And he says, and Fulda was one of them. They had five uh, armored divisions, tank destroyer divisions, tank divisions, but five armored divisions in the little, little city of Fulda, you know. Couldn't believe it. But uh, they, they were sitting there at that point. In fact, the strange, and it is a coincidence, I didn't know that until about four weeks ago, I got a letter from him with a picture. 
Harry Hurley's son, Bobby, became a tanker. And he sent me a picture of his tank in uh, Vietnam. And he said the picture was taken about two weeks before we got caught in an ambush. They destroyed the tank. And he came out uh, just uh, burns all over. And after that, they gave him a hundred percent discharge because of his burns and other injuries. And crazy kid, he fought to try to re-enlist. He said, you're crazy. You got a hundred percent disability. How the hell can you go back in the army? But Bobby says he wants to go in. Finally, somebody who had political contact got Senator D'Amato to represent him, and he must have gone down, down to Washington and got somebody to get him back in. Bobby came in with his outfit, and they started occupation in Fulda in June of 1985, a month after we were there in May, and he came into Fulda in June of 1985 to uh, start his... Uh, uh, reserve, but uh, he was with the tank outfit again, of course. But he, he was stationed in Fulda there for about a year and a half, uh, uh, two years. But it was just a strange coincidence on, you know, on the things that you could find that would happen at the same mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fulda was not such a big town, but uh, of course, uh, Kennedy, who loved comfort, when he decided to uh, make a battalion. CP, command post, naturally the best place in town was the biggest hotel. <laughs> so the biggest hotel in town became 1st Battalion Headquarters. <laughs> now where did you encounter your first combat? Well, uh, my first combat, uh, we were in the Hurtgen Forest, but uh, we didn't do too much uh, uh, fighting at that point. It was more or less a holding situation. and. Uh, I think it was December 16th, they captured three or four German paratroopers in American officers' uniforms. And uh, the paratrooper told the uh, uh, battalion commander, at that time it was Riemann Schneider, told the battalion commander that they were supposed to be dropped down and capture and hold the Manchu Road to wait for the, the infantry to come in, and then the armor was supposed to come through on its way to the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. On the 17th, of course, they struck. And there again, there's another tale of coincidence. Uh, one of the first things our division did was they struck out of the Siegfried line, and uh, they captured three cities. I, I think Rollsbroek was one, but Pickerath and Simmerath were the two big ones. They were in and out of uh, Kestenik, but couldn't hold it. Uh, we found out later that Kestenik had several of the main arteries that the Germans used for supplies, and no way they were going to let that town fall. But we did capture uh, uh, Pickerath and Simmerath, and we used to listen to the BBC, and always used to chuckle when they'd come down the line from Holland and now or now or now. He says, then we come to Simmerath and turn west to Malmody, you know. Because we, we held the uh, northern corner, north northwestern uh, corner of the uh, bulge for about five weeks before the bulge co collapsed. But uh, it was pretty frightening. And the funny thing is, we had captured a staff officer and he told us that German intelligence had told them that there were two green outfits in the line. They didn't have the names of them, but they were told there were two green outfits in the line. But after we captured the Bikarath and Simmerath, and we were just sticking out like a little bubble. You see the map, it, it sticks out in a bubble out of the line coming down. And after we captured the two towns, the German high command said that maybe we were trying to fool them and sent in a seasoned outfit as a green one. So they hit the 106th Division, which was just below us. That was the outfit we were in Tennessee on maneuvers with. And the 106th was in uh, an area 
which the army had considered quiet, and they had about, uh, I think, a regiment or, or two of the 28th Division that had come back there for a rest area, They're sitting right behind the 106th. And when they went through, they just destroyed the 106th. I think they had 8,000 ca casualties that morning. But the division was so battered that it was never, they never replaced the men that were missing and they took the 106th off the books. There no longer is the 106th Infantry Division. So they just, just wiped it out after, after that, that incident. So again, the quirk of fate. Yeah. They could have gone through us or they could have gone through them. I don't think we had any better armored defense to stop uh, von Rundstedt than uh, they had down there. And uh, it, it, it really w was, a, it was something because uh, uh, there again, you'd have to say, was von Rundstedt and his, and his people doing right when they decided they weren't going to leave the 82nd, the Bastards of Bastogne? They weren't going to leave them. They were going to capture them. So they stopped and they encircled Bastogne. And I forget how many uh, days it went on before the bulge finally collapsed. But I don't know if you remember the story. I think the general's name was McAuliffe, but I'm not yes. sure was the general in charge of uh, the 82nd. And von Rundstedt sent them orders <coughs> to take his men out and surrender. And McAuliffe just sent them back one word, nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which goes down in history, you know, as a, as a battle reply. But uh, they, they sat there for quite a while. Uh, and I believe that the Germans probably made a mistake I think they should have left a small force to contain them and had tried to continue their drive because they were headed for Antwerp. Mm -hmm. If they had captured Antwerp, was the only town north of Le Havre that had sufficient docks and uh, space to supply us. Uh, if they had captured Antwerp, that would have left about 20 divisions us and north of us were the British, but it would have left about 20 divisions without any possible means of supply if they had been able, been successful to go to, uh, to Antwerp. But uh, as it was, uh, they got stopped before they hit the uh, Moose River, and that was the end. Uh, now, with uh, you being in a headquarters company, how close were you to the front? Oh. To the front? Yeah. Well, when we went to uh, Diedenborn, uh, we went through B Company, and uh, Bill Gannon was the a communication sergeant for B Company. And we come down the hill, and Gannon sees me. He says, Sam, what the hell are you doing here? He says, we're the reserve company. He says, C and A are in front of us, and they're attacking companies. He says, where are you going? But the Colonel Raymond Schneider was that way. He had a tendency or a fixation that he had to be right in the front all the time. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually got there with the uh, attacking company, with uh, Captain Collins. And as I said, I think they got 22 or 23 men across the river and captured Diedenborn that night. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that was close enough to the front. Uh, then. Uh, the, probably the most exciting day we had, uh, right after the uh, bulge ended, we started our first attack outside of the Siegfried line. Uh, our battalion had been given a uh, target of the uh, uh, city or town of uh, Eicherscheid, and we were attached to a tank battalion. The tank commander was in charge of the fighting group. So at this point, Re Raymond Schneider was secondary to the tank commander. Of course, we got into the Sherman. They did. There wasn't enough room for me to get down, so I sat up on top of the tank behind the turret. And we got to a crest of a hill just before 
you could see Eichershide. Of course, they stopped and the two of them went out to view the situation and see what the terrain was like, etc., etc. And of course, the tank commander, who probably had been educated by Patton, and Patton's favorite remark was, one tank is worth a thousand infantrymen, because we never agreed with that, but this tank commander must have thought the same thing, because he and Raymond Schneider had a lot of discussions about who was going to go into the town first. The tank commander wanted the infantry to capture the town and then have the tanks come in. But after we started, we broke over the crest of the hill and we started to uh, attack. The infantry was in, in the lead. Our tank got bogged down in snow. Of course, then the 88 started to come down up the hill toward us and I wasn't about ready to sit on top of that tank with with that stuff coming up and I guess I didn't realize how much weight I had because besides my weight I had a 40 pound radio, I had a 10 pound rifle and I had a, a field pack. So I jumped off the tank and I got buried in the snow and couldn't get out. <laughs> Lucky enough for me, the colonels and, and the uh, radio operator for the uh, tank commander pulled me out of the snow and then we we started down the hill and oh, I guess we maybe had gone a couple hundred yards and the tank commander was wounded and they evacuated him. Now at this point that put Riemann Schneider in charge of the, the, uh, the uh, group that had tanks and things. So then he sent the tanks in first in front of the infantry and the first Sherman to uh, get on the road was destroyed by a tiger that was sitting in an old barn. Couldn't see it, but I guess they could see out a window or something and could see what was coming. And uh, the puss Sherman come running, running down the road, and just as he got to pass this barn, the pow! The tiger hit him and he was gone. The Sherman, uh, which really wasn't the uh, decent equipment. It weighed 35 tons. It had a 75 millimeter cannon, three feet, three foot barrel. The Tiger had an 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, weighed 70 tons. The Sherman would go across a muddy field and get stuck in the mud, and the Tiger twice its weight would run right across because it had better than twice the track size and also it had uh, uh, the Sherman, that we, we didn't get it until the Pershing, it had uh, independent bogey wheels. Our bogey wheels were all rigid that the tank track ran on, but the Tiger had independent wheels, so if it went over a big rock, the tank tra tread would just go over the big rock, the bo bogey wheels would rise up in into the body of the tank. So the, the Tiger was a, a, a ferocious weapon. We never saw anything to equal it until we finally got the uh, Pershing after uh, Remagen. But we got down and we captured uh, Eichershide before the, uh, the night was over, so we were set in there. But uh, our 2nd Battalion uh, tried to take Kestenik and uh, that, that was a different uh, battle. Uh, we had one man, uh, they called him Ed Kelly, his first name was Jonah, but I guess he liked Ed better. He was a staff sergeant with the, in E Company. And the story is that after being wounded twice, of course staying in action, he attacked a machine gun nest, not the machine gun nest, but at the same time lost his life. So Ed received the only uh, uh, Congressional Medal that the division ever received. And another thing that with that is, is uh, strange and I think it's a, a credit to the organization. Uh, right after the war, uh, Ed came from a little uh, town called Kaiser, West Virginia. And right after the war, the association started to make small scholarships to high school graduates in Kaiser. And then somewhere, maybe about 20 or 25 years ago, uh, 
somebody in the association decided that it's really not good to be taking the money out piecemeal like that. He says, we'll put up 15000 he says, if the men in the association will match it. So at least we'll have 30000 and work off that. Uh, I think I'm somewhere here I have the, the book. As of uh, August of '03, the Kelly Fund had just passed $117,000. And uh, in that issue, there was, uh, I think, 780 some odd dollars. Every time along, people make donations to the Kelly Fund. So at this point, they're not doing anything, of course, except uh, giving away the interest. But the principle at this point is so big that, uh, you know, it, it bothered me a little bit. And I checked with somebody. I says, well, who's going to take that over when we're gone? He says, oh, he says, uh, the powers that be have already thought of that. He says, the... Uh, system is now being run by some of the first recipients. So you had the f first mm -hmm. couple of recipients of the awards mm -hmm. that are now running the thing, protecting the money and making sure that it, it will remain uh, as long. Long after we're dead and gone, they'll still be giving scholarships out to uh, kinds of high school graduates. Mm -hmm. Now you s told us earlier you had an encounter with uh a jet. Could you tell us about that? With what? The ME6 the, uh, or 262? 262? Yeah. Well, they, they come over and bobbed and straced us one time. At the uh, Remagen Bridge, as I said, they really couldn't, couldn't do anything. They couldn't get close enough to the bridge to uh, hit it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the times that we actually saw it in combat, They'd come over and strafe and bomb, and as I said, our, our anti-aircraft sometimes looked like it was two miles behind <laughs> behind the plane. It, it just was a, a uh, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable weapon when, when they came across. And of course, the, the sound itself <laughs> was frightening, because we had never heard jet airplanes mm -hmm. before. But uh, that was really quite a weapon. We, well, you have to remember that Hitler and his people planned for the war for a long time before we even thought of it, you know. And uh, they were working on the jets and, and produced them before we got them. But it was a very frightening weapon. When they, it came over the front lines, uh, I say our, our anti-aircraft just couldn't do anything with it because they didn't have uh, electronically controlled mm -hmm. like you have today. Mm -hmm. It was all visually, but uh, uh, that, it, it, it was really something. But uh, we didn't see them that often because, uh, as a rule, they're not going to uh, do any the infantry. One of my uh, grandsons once asked me, how many Germans did you kill with a rifle? So I said, I, I never even shot a rifle in combat. He said, what did you do? I said, well, we were involved in a different kind of war. About two days after we left Hanif, our battalion took the... Uh, uh, east bank of the Rhine. We went from uh, Erpel, which is the other side of uh, Remagen. We went from Erpel up to Boyle, which is the other side of the river from Bonn. And at one point, we had hit a, uh, a stretch of ground where there was probably 800 or 1,000 yards of flat plain leading up to this little hill. It wasn't too big a hill, but with natural caves and then other uh, installations, they had like pillboxes built into the face of this cave mm -hmm. and there was absolutely no way that we could get across that field and get to the road which was between the hill and the Rhine at that point. But someone was able, I don't know how, to obtain four uh, Thunderbolt fighter bombers for use in the attack. So of course before the attack, I worked with the uh, Air Force uh, uh, radio uh, man, and the two of us were on the face of the, of the hill, and each uh, infantry squad squad was giving uh, given a uh, was a canvas bag with four panels, well, about three foot by twelve foot, 
but the panels were phosphorescent and very, very bright colors. The sequence of the panels had to be set according for the code of the day. And we could put red, green, green, white, yellow, whatever it would be, but they had to go cut it to the part of the day. So I got in touch with the company commanders at the front line and told them that as soon as we tell them, you don't want to put them out too early because then the Germans will know exactly where we were. So as, as the planes are coming in, he says, I want to have your men set the panels up. I said, I ain't going to worry about no code today. I said, just set them up. And I could hear one of the pilots as he approached. He says, oh my God, he says, look at that. He says, that's the most beautiful dotted line I ever saw in my life. They actually released their bombs before they had passed over our front line. But because the bombs were tra traveling 300 some odd miles an hour, but they hit the, the plane and they bounced like rocks. When you throw a stone mm -hmm. off the river, that's what they did. Just bounced along and hit that hit. And as the, uh, I, don't know, I think each plane carried eight bombs, so uh, you figure that'd be uh, uh, four, four uh, thunderbolts, that'd be 32 bombs. Mm -hmm. When those bombs hit that cliff, you had this tremendous explosion, a big puff of smoke, and when the smoke went away, there was no hill there. Hmm. So the, now, it, how large were these panels? The panels, I think, I think about three by twelve. Mm -hmm. But each squad would put a panel out in front of their thing, and and the pilots just couldn't get over with the sun shining on them. The uh, way it, it, it des designated the front line. So they knew exactly where our people were. But of course you didn't want to have them sitting out there too long because the mm -hmm. Germans would see them too. But of course once the uh, planes went over then they uh, removed the panels and put them away again. But uh, that's what I told my grandson. That's a different kind of war, you know. Our, our job uh, was basically to uh, keep communications within the uh, unit. And uh, once and you we carried, got you carried a, an M1. Yeah, we carried an M1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you carry any sidearm or anything no, else? Or no, just no. The Only one? officers carried sidearms. Mm -hmm. No, we carried the M1 and the radio, so you got 50 pounds between the two of them, mm -hmm. which uh, after a day's work was pretty good. Uh, that's funny because uh, the chances are it saved my life because <laughs> after Eike Scheiden and uh, Diedenborn. The colonel told the uh, platoon leader, he says, oh, he says uh, he, he's had enough in these last two days. He says, we're going out on a, uh, it was like a uh, uh, investigative patrol. He says, uh, give me somebody else today. Uh, there's not going to be any combat. He says, we're going to go out and, and search the area. So they went into a, a town called Ruhrberg and Again, he was standing out in a square. The radio operator had been sent up in my place, had just come up from the uh, uh, Repel Depel replacement uh, unit, and he had never seen a shell fall. So the whole command group was standing in the square, and when the 70, uh, 88 started to come in, Bob said, to hell with this shit, and he ran into the nearest building. <laughs> The battalion commander lost both of his legs. The platoon leader was wounded. They lost two international correspondent, a uh, uh, artillery uh, officer, mm -hmm. and uh, three or four enlisted men. And the only man who was not wounded was Bob, because <laughs> he had enough sense to get the hell out of the square and get into the building. <laughs> but if I had been there, I probably would have been standing right behind the colonel. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, uh, to, to me, it uh, was an incident that saved my life, and of course, then we got a new battalion commander. That's when uh, Kennedy came in. He came in as a major, but then received his promotion to a lieutenant colonel before long. But uh, Kennedy was an unusual individual. But uh, in what ways? Well, but as I said before, he liked discomfort. If we hit a, a town, we took a town. All the officers in the battalion would be looking for the deepest cellar they could find, but not Lyle. Lyle was looking for the place that had the biggest, most comfortable bed in the town. 
<laughs> it could be on the second floor. He didn't care. That was going to be his, his spot for, for the night. Because at that point, uh, uh, we used to jump like from town to town. So we'd take this town, the next day we'd move up and take the other town. We went across the Cologne Plain. And the funny thing is we were uh, preparing, once we hit the Rhine, we were preparing to go south to cross the R River through the wine region and clear out the uh, uh, western bank of, of the Rhine at that point. And uh, they told us we'd have a day off and we could do what we want. Of course, when a GI gets a day off, the first thing he does is find something to drink. And about 10 or 10.30 at night, Kennedy sends down, he says, come on up, he says, uh, our orders are change. He says, we're not going across the R uh, in the next couple of days. He says, somebody says they captured a bridge over the Rhine. He says, and we're going to go. So here we are at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning throwing guys into the trunk, most of them busy as drunk. And <laughs> some of them in their long johns throwing their uniforms and their weapons into the, into the trucks with them. And we took off from there. And uh, we crossed uh, uh, the Ludendorff, I guess, about 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they said, uh, one of the books here I have, that uh, by 11 a.m. there were 8,000 men across the Rhine. Of course, our 3,000 was three of the eight that was there. We were the first full infantry regiment to get across. They had parts of other units, but the uh, bridge itself had been captured by... Uh, a battalion of our 3 10th Infantry had been assigned to the uh, uh, tank battalion that was attacking. Uh, when they saw the bridge, they didn't know if they wanted to go across or not. And finally, I forget which one of the generals, but they got back to one of the generals and he told them that if they can get across, go. Uh, it was a railroad bridge, which of course wasn't exactly the best for trucks and, and, uh, and other vehicles. What they did is they, uh, the engineers got logs and laid them between the ties mm -hmm. so that you had... So you, little... you crossed the Romagen Bridge itself? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was the Ludendorff Railroad Bridge mm -hmm. that went from Romagen uh, to Erpel on the other mm -hmm. side. Uh, when it got to Erpel, it went like right into a tunnel. But uh, uh, we got across about 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it's funny because the... Uh, truck driver asked one of the men, he says, how far have we gone on this side of the river? <laughs> and the kid looks up at me, he says, you see that guy up there? He's, That's as far as we've gone. Well, I never saw a deuce and a half turn around and get, get moving as fast as that thing did. <laughs> yeah, the quartermaster wasn't you, used to being up at the front, but there we were. And one of the strange things, uh, there was a fairly good sized city called Hanif. And that was one of our big targets at, at the north. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy took the infantry battalion and marched them up the river well, from one, about 1 o'clock in the morning. Marched them up the river on the banks of the Rhine. At one point, Joe Grimaldi said he was close enough to almost smell the smoke of the cigarettes of the guys sitting there <laughs> looking. But they were up on top and the battalion went through. But you had a whole infantry battalion that marched through the German lines to get up to Hanif. Mm. I don't know what the hell the Germans felt like in the morning. They woke up and they got two battalions in front of them and one battalion behind. Because <laughs> we captured Hanif. I guess we, we secured the, the city within about two days. But after that, is, uh, we had that incident with the cliff. Uh, but uh, uh, we were... We were uh, I guess, I don't know, remember exactly how many cities we, we captured, but we captured quite a few towns until we got up to Buell or Boyle, which is across the river from Bonn. Mm -hmm. But at that point, we hit the Sieg River, and uh, they weren't about ready to start crossing the Sieg yet. But uh, another strange thing happened when we were occupying the Sieg because we had a very, very large, I don't remember what the extent of the front was, for the battalion, but it was much too big for our communication system. And we had an instrument which uh, 
was illegal at the time, but it was an instrument that could connect wire to radio so that anybody who was on the telephone in the field could get back to us and then we would broadcast over the radio or whatever it would be. So this lieutenant from the Signal Corps takes a look. He says, you ain't allowed to do that. He says, look, please. He says, look, he says, here's the map. Here's where we are. I say, ain't nothing we have that's going to go from here to there to there to there to there to there. I says, we have to combine wire and radio to be mm -hmm. able to do it. So he looks at it. He says, he says you have that whole stretch in, in close communication? I said, yeah, yeah. Between wire and radio, that whole stretch is, is intact. He turns around and he says, I was never here. <laughs> and he left. We're going to have to stop you here. Go to a second tape. Remember this? Yeah. Why this one? Now, it, it could be possible. They're talking about the same Madonna. Yeah, I don't know. It's very possible. Okay. Ready? Okay, now you just mentioned um, that uh, when you were back at uh, Fort Bragg, they talked to you about improvising. Uh, you did this with, with splicing the, the radio into well, what communication we, lines. What, what did the officer say about improvising? Oh, nothing. Uh, it was a piece of equipment that had been issued. Mm -hmm. But your colonel back uh, when you were back at Bragg told you about how important oh, it was to improvise yeah. in a battlefield. Yeah. Could you tell us about that on the tape? I mean, uh, to improvise in that, in that situation? Yes, yeah. Why... It, with that improv, piece of equipment? Improv, improv, yeah. <laughs> Why it's important to improvise on the battlefield. You had mentioned this well, just as we got off tape. Oh, you have, to, you have to learn to improvise. And in this situation, they made this piece of equipment illegal mm -hmm. because it connected wire to radio. And when the uh, uh, lieutenant from the Signal Corps was there, I says, well, I says, let me show you what happens. Mm -hmm. And when the infantry officer called in on the phone, our operator told him, in no uncertain terms, the next time you touch that button, the toggle switch on your double E8, that was a telephone in a leather bag, the next time you touch that toggle switch, you are going to be on the air and you will use radio security. And just remember that. The next time you touch that toggle switch, you're going to be a, on radio security. Mm -hmm. And made two or three calls, and all of them worked out well. So the uh, Signal Corps officer was pretty well satisfied that we had the you know situation under uh, containment. But uh, you had to uh, learn to do things like that because... Uh, we were in a fairly stagnant situation, but we were spread, spread over a, such a large piece of ground on the uh, uh, Sea River on the south side that in no way could have we have been able to communicate over that distance without using wire and phone. Mm -hmm. In fact, while we were there, we had a crazy kid, I think his name was Seal, came from California. He decided to swim over the other side of the sea and see what's doing over there. Well, Steele gets over there, and he gets captured by an SS officer. The SS officer had a pretty good head on him. So he says, you're going to stay with me. So he kept them with him until they got recaptured. He said, remember, he says, when they get you back, he says, you tell them how good I treated you. He says, no, they talk about the SS being terrible. He says, but we're not all so bad. <laughs> And so Steele stayed with him until... Did uh, you eventually cross the Sea River? Oh, yeah, we crossed the Sea River, and uh, that was what they called the Roar Pocket. pocket yeah. In the end, uh, it was na re renamed the Rose Pocket, because General Rose, I forget which di armor division he was with, but he was on a night patrol uh, right after they closed uh, the pocket, and they got caught by a German patrol, and, and he was killed. Uh, you don't get too many... Major generals that get killed on patrols, you know. Mm -hmm. So they named it the Rose Pocket in, in his name a after it. But that was a, a, a strange situation because everyone who was in the pocket knew that they had no one to nowhere to go. Patton at that point, I think, was halfway to Berlin, you know. So uh, our little 
pocket or area that was contained there. Uh, we went through there, I, I don't know, it was about a week or ten days, and we finally ended up in uh, the city of Wuppertal, which was one of the biggest industrial areas up there, not too far from Kolin. And uh, when we came into the town, the, the civilians went crazy. They started looting, looting, breaking into stores and warehouses and, and taking things all over the place. And finally, uh, uh, Kennedy got a couple people with blow horns and uh, they told them if they don't stop this, they're going to all end up in a, in a detention camp. Of course, then they took uh, knowledge of this and the, the looting and the the wildness stopped, but uh, that's where we ended up in Wuppertal. The war was still on, but uh, we were so far before behind what you would call a front that mm -hmm. they sent us uh, down, and that's where we ended up in, in Fulda. Uh, that was May of uh, 45. Uh, I, I think uh, May 8th, I think, was VE Day. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we were in Fulda at that time. So, mm -hmm. uh, Were you ever aware of the concentration camps? Oh no, we uh, we were never. Oh yeah, we captured one town, which had a, in quotes, hospital, mm -hmm. gas chamber. And when they interviewed the uh, mayor, the burgomeister, uh, he was telling them they had no idea about what was going in. Uh, our battalion interpreter, a kid named Hinkst, he came from an a, a area in Texas where he didn't speak English until he got into public school. Mm -hmm. He spoke German and nothing else, you know, because that made a perfect interpreter for us. And Hinkst just went crazy. It took about three men to pull him, pull him off. Cause I, I could hear him screaming and understood enough German to uh, what he was telling me. He says, what do you mean? You see thousands of people going in and nobody ever coming out. Mm -hmm. yeah. He wanted to kill this guy. But uh, it, uh, it wasn't that big a, uh, a hospital. Mm -hmm. but, and I don't know how many they killed, but it was a gas chamber thing, not, not a place where they kept people uh, in the concentration camps, uh, but uh, that's about the only place we found that was like that. Uh, one of the places that we hit uh, <coughs> uh, on the Rhine before we got to, uh, to Boyle was, uh, I forget the name of the castle, but it's the castle where uh, the Teutonic Knight Siegfried slew the dragon mm -hmm. and saved his town. The castle was up on top of the hill. And we went down to look at the cave in which Siegfried had slain the dragon. And the cave was a massive factory making uh, airplane parts. So they had converted this giant cave into an underground factory. They had buildings out in the flatlands outside and we used to bomb the hell out of the buildings. <laughs> there was never anything in them. The factory was in, in the cave in the, in the side of the mountain under the, under the castle. But uh, they, they were pretty ingenious people. Uh, you figure you take a cave like that and you turn it into an airplane factory making the airplane parts. But uh, and yeah, that was about a day before we, uh, two days before we got the uh, the boil. So, but uh, the raw pocket was, uh, I, don't, I think we we captured about maybe fifty or sixty thousand prisoners in there because they knew they had nowhere to go, mm -hmm. and so many of them decided they weren't going to fight, and no sense of get, getting killed at this point, because I think by that time uh, everybody just about knew the war was over. Oh, was on his oh, way. I'm sorry. Yeah. Where, uh, where were you, and do you remember your reaction when you heard about the death of Pro President Roosevelt? Uh, I don't remember where I was, but mm -hmm. uh, we were shocked. I now, uh, did it come in over your radio? Yeah. Well, I, well uh, yeah, probably come in over our radios. Uh, 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 we used to listen to BBC a lot, and uh, it probably came in over the radio mm -hmm. that he had passed. 
and of course that goes into a, another area about the man who replaced him. Nobody ever expected him to be anything big, but he turned out to be one of the strongest and one of the best. But uh, we felt uh, a little afraid after Roosevelt passed because he he was an unusual president. He was able to get along with the other. Uh, the leaders of the other countries, and mm -hmm. that that was something. That's what was necessary. Of course, that was Eisenhower's uh, biggest fort. Uh, they say Eisenhower wasn't that good of a military man. However, he did have the ability to get the British and the French to work together with the Americans, which of course was absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. But uh, Eisenhower was a uh, a great commander. And I guess in the long run, uh, he probably was a good military man too. But it, it takes all kinds of men to fight a war. You have some that fight, fight it peacefully or quietly, and you have others like Patton that li like to raise hell all the time. But it, uh, it, it was a strange war, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Did you serve in the Army of Occupation? Uh, I was there for just a, a couple of months and then I had enough points to get home. But uh, our division was split. Uh, the 311th took over Bremen and Breverhaven and the 39th and 310th went over and took over uh, Berlin. I think they stayed there uh, for about six or eight months and then they were relieved and the division came back and uh, was disassembled. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I wouldn't say I was really in occupation mm -hmm. to, to, to that extent. We were in occupation where we were, mm -hmm. uh, when we were in Fulda and in the other cities, but uh, it was, it was not, not uh, like after the war had ended and uh, you had problems there. With the when, when did you go home? Uh, I left, I think, in uh, October of 45, and I went to the 84th Division because they were coming home. And I had enough points at that uh, stage to go home with an outfit. So uh, one or two of the other men from uh, our platoon went to the 84th, the Woodchoppers Division, and we uh, stayed there for, uh, oh, I guess, about three months, I guess. So they got everything all organized. Mm -hmm. But we were living in Heidelberg, which was a pretty nice place to live in comparison to some of the other places that we had been in. But uh, one of the strange things that I think it was the second day after we crossed the Ludendorff, we captured a mansion, the Mauser Mansion. Uh, to the average person in the army it didn't mean anything, but it happened to be my wife's maiden name. Mm -hmm. So it had other significance to So us. you were married before you went into service? No, no. Uh, oh, okay. I got married afterward. Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, the funny thing is, because all the Germans had left mm -hmm. before we got there, and all they left behind were the French uh, employees. Of course, the French were so happy to see us come, and we had been on uh, C ration and K rations, living out of cans for a couple of days, because they wouldn't allow any kitchens to come across the bridge yet. And we get to the to the Mauser mansion, and the, uh, the French maids go running down to to larders downstairs. They had, I think, three levels where they stored their salamis and their bolognis and their hams. And they come running up with all this meat and throw it on, on the table. Of course, we ate pretty well that, that day. But the next day we were gone to another spot. But uh, that, that, that was quite, a, quite an incident to, ca to capture the, uh, that house. Was that the uh, arms manufacturer, Mauser? Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to tease my father-in-law. I says, well, there were two very big Mauser families in Germany. One made some pretty good weapons. I said, the other made honeydew wagons. I said, and if you lived in the country, <laughs> I said, you saw a lot of honeydew wagons. I said, which family did you come from? <laughs> and he used to just laugh. But uh, when we were in the, in the rural areas, that, that, that was more, one of the most important things you mm -hmm. could have. Yep. Have the honey with do wagons running around empty in all the holes. When were you discharged? Uh, I was discharged uh, uh, on January 26th, I think, uh, 1946 it was, yeah.
uh, from uh, uh, Fort Dix. Okay. But uh, the division was deactivated again. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm fairly proud of, I don't know if I have it here, the uh, men in the 78th in uh, In 1919, some of the men from the 78th went to Paris to a meeting in the Cirque de Paris to attend a convention that formed the American Legion. Wow. So that's if the. If you hold that right in front of you, Wayne can focus on it. You can see it in the uh, upper corner toward the tag. You have the 78th Division and the 82nd. Of course, at that point, the 82nd was not yet an airborne division. It was just an infantry division at that point. But the uh, men from our division were there for the uh, three days to form mm -hmm. the American Legion. Mm -hmm. So to me, it, it, it's, a, it's a point of honor to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, did you join, uh, join any veterans organizations when well, you returned? Well, I'm, I'm a life member of the American Legion. I'm a life member of the DAV. And I'm also a life member of our division association. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, this, I thought, was something because uh, it was a uh, DAV magazine. And the August of 80, I have to put my glasses on, I can't read it. Yeah, August of 85. And they talk about the great battles of World War II. And they list 18 battles, including Anzio, Anzio Bataan, Pearl Harbor, and they include the Ludendorff Bridge, mm -hmm. the bridge at Remagen, mm -hmm. in, in, in those uh, battles. Mm -hmm. which are not, to me, that is something. To be put in the same class with Iwo Jima, Tarawa, and uh, Suribachi and those, it was really something. But whoever wrote the uh, article for the uh, DAV magazine, uh, felt that uh, the Bridget Remagen was that important, you know. Mm -hmm. But we just happened to be there. And Did you uh, ever make use of the GI Bill? Uh, well, I started. I went for about two or three months, but I came from a large family and it was impossible for me to do my homework. So after, after three months I quit. I just couldn't. I was going to uh, Brooklyn Polytech. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I just couldn't keep up with the curricula, trying to do my homework after midnight every night. Mm -hmm. So I went about three months and then. Mm -hmm. then Did you I ever quit. use the fifty-two twenty club? Uh, what was that? That was the uh, twenty dollars a week for fifty-two oh, weeks. It was yeah, like an unemployment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then, I, I was on that for a little while, mm -hmm. but then uh, I, I finally was taken back into into the deluxe lab. So. I returned there and worked there for a while until I, I left to go uh, take municipal employment. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you think your time in service either changed or affected your life? Well, I would say that the uh, the time in service was a very important thing. As we used to joke, it made men out of boys uh, in Israel. You have to go into the service for two years mm -hmm. when you come out of high school. And then if you want to go to college, you can go. But for two years, you have to stay in the service. And I think that the, it, it's quite an unusual thing and, and a good thing. Because when you're in the service, you get to uh, see a lot of people. And you get to go to a lot of different places. And I think that in the end, it can give you a broader scope on what is available and possibly what you want to do for the rest of your life, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, our group, and we still get together, uh, last year we uh, met down in the city and uh, at Dave's uh, place. Uh, the year before that we were up in Maine at uh, Joe Grimaldi's and this year we're talking about uh, going to Boston. We haven't finalized the plans yet. But uh, Bobby's mother is uh, Joe Grimaldi's sister, and Betty married Har Harry. Harry died of a brain tumor in 53. But uh, 
Bobby says he might come up because he doesn't see his mother that often, mm -hmm. and he would like to meet us because I haven't seen Bobby since his father uh, since his father wake, his wake in '53. But uh, he, he has heard a lot about us, and he thought it might not be a bad idea to come up and meet us. So maybe he'll come up, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll get together in Boston. Now, out of the six of you that were together, how many are still living? Well, uh, you talked about your group of six. Uh, out of the six, what do we have? Just four, I guess, left. Well, that's uh, pretty good. Steve. Dave. Uh, actually, it's a, really only three of us, I think, right? Joe Young. Well, Joe Young was wire. But out of the radio, I think we just have the three left. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dave, Dave, Joe, and myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Harry passed, and uh, uh, one of the men moved to uh, or went back to uh, Kansas City, and uh, duty our uh, radio chief, and then uh, platoon sergeant went back to Texas, where he came from. Uh, and one of the times, I don't know how he did it, but we were up in Maine at a reunion, and Joe Grimaldi found duty in Mississippi. And we made a long-distance call and, and talked to him, because he was in his late 90s by that time. Because uh, when we went into combat, I think uh, Bill Doody was 31 or 32. Of course, that was an old man. Yeah, he was an old guy. That was an old man in the infantry, yeah. But uh, he, he had his own way of life. In fact, he told us that he used to be uh, with a, uh, I think it was seismograph uh, crew, uh, with one of the big oil companies, mm -hmm. and he said that uh, one of the nicest places he'd ever seen in the whole world was down in uh, South America. I think it was Peru. They were almost equal with the equator, but they were so high in the mountains that the temperature in the area there were never varied more than 20 degrees for the whole year. Mm -hmm. Like imagine living in some place that it went from 50 to 70 all year, <laughs> and. Uh, but they didn't find any oil up there. Mm -hmm. Could you hold this in front of you and tell us where and when that was taken? Oh, uh, this was taken in Fulda. Mm -hmm. That's the hotel behind okay. us. If you face it toward the camera. Oh, yeah. And so that was taken in uh, 45? 45, yeah, in uh, May of 45. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, Kennedy decided if he was going to have a battalion headquarters, the biggest hotel in town would be the best place to have it. So that became battalion headquarters. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, you did have some, some photographs. Well, I don't know if you'd want to look, but... That was our... Reunion in in Overape in, in May of '85. That's Marie with a new husband, and that's the Black Madonna there, oh, okay. sitting on the mantel. But uh, that was quite nice. I got to, we got to her house about uh, 11 p.m. after we had left the Holiday Inn in Liège, and we didn't leave till about three o'clock in the morning. Now, where are you in that second picture? Uh, in this one. Yeah, that's just me point here. yourself out. Yeah, that's me uh, right behind Marie. That's mm -hmm. Dave Sachs on uh, on this end, and that's Joe Grimaldi on this end. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, the uh, after seeing the different places that we found, this is a copy of a sketch that I have made of this old church, and when we got to the town. This is what we found in 85, because we couldn't believe it. This is the house we lived in for about five weeks. And all the husband was, uh, would say, he says, you guys killed my cow. I said, I don't know if your artillery or our, our artillery killed it, he said, but somebody killed your cow. But that's the house we lived in about, for about six weeks until we took off for Eichershaid. But the church, when uh, uh, Joe Grimaldi showed the pencil sketch, the woman started shouting. She says, ah, oh, the Alta Kirka, the Alta Kirka. She says, go, go up there, you know. So we went up to the new church, which I think was celebrating its 25th anniversary. And lo and behold, some parishioner 
had made a scale model of the old church and had it in the uh, uh, vestibule of, of the church as you got into it. But uh, that was one of the towns where we had stayed. Now this is uh, Fulda, where the picture was taken, uh, and this is the hotel. Now, if you look at the postcard, you can notice the statue in front of the hotel. Now, I can't remember the name of the statue, but he's one of the well-known saints in that area, and people from all over Europe come to see him. However, I had this picture taken at exactly the same angle. Mm -hmm. And if you look, you can't see the statue. All you can see is the garden area leading to the statue. So the artist who made the oh. postcard for the hotel used our artistic liberty and moved the statue where you could see it. Mm -hmm. In other words, come stay in our hotel. The statue is right across the street. You know? But the, that was a... Uh, the that used to be a, uh, uh, a trolley barn. And then it became a restaurant. Mm -hmm. So when we went there, we uh, had snacks outside on the terrace with the, uh, the hotel in the background. But uh, yeah, th this plane was sitting right alongside the uh, fountain where I was sitting. So that's, that's you in that picture? Uh, yeah, that's me here and me here. I guess it's me here in my Irish fisherman sweater. But we went to uh, to Fulda. Then this was the last town. And when we got there, Joe shows the man a picture of him and a little girl. And the man got so excited, he went running into the house and came out with a picture of his wife and that same girl taken in 1946 after we had left. And the bus driver came over and he said to me, he says, uh, you're going to have to put me in a picture and send me a copy. He says, because my friends will never believe that you people came back 40 years later and found us. And Joe corresponded with them later. And uh, this is Edith, who was a little girl at that time. and. This is her, with, with her husband. But uh, this was the house we lived in. Half was used by the wire section and half by the radio section. But uh, I had a laugh when the uh, bus driver came over. He says, you got to take a picture of me and send it. He says, because nobody will believe that you could find these people 40 years later. And the, uh, he's the uncle. And uh, he's a, a, his... Uh, son and daughter, and one has what, Ohio State uh, sweatshirt on the other? I can't tell, but the, the two of them are wearing uh, uh, sweatshirts and things. When he looked at the picture, and he looked up at the building, and he laughs, he says, look at that. He says, in 40 years we didn't close that door. <laughs> Pardon? Go back one page. Explain that antenna. No, the next one. When you guys put oh, it yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what we did, at this point, the war was over. And we were about 25 miles from regimental headquarters. And our set, the big one, would go no more than five miles. Mm -hmm. So... Harry, who had graduated from RCA Institute before he came to us, says, I'll build you an antenna that you can reach him. I said, what do you mean you'll build me an antenna? He says, oh yeah. He says, we'll cut an antenna to one half a wavelength of the transmission, uh, the, uh, the frequency on which we're transmitting. He says, you tap that an uh, antenna one third of the way from one of the ends, you use coaxial cable to come down so that the cable will not receive any radio signals. He says, but it has to be perpendicular to the line of transmission to regimental headquarters. Because then we had to get a map and a compass and everything, and we had to decide what we were going to do. Well, this was my room here, 
radio room. So we ended up stringing an antenna from here over to that building. And that was at the time the uh, Alita, uh, Allied Military Government Building, AMG. So we had to get permission from somebody over there before we could go up and put an antenna on their roof. But we ended up uh, stringing uh, that antenna up and it came time to send the first message to the regiment. So Harry says, go ahead, you do it. I said, come on, that's your idea, you do it. So he sent the message to the regiment and they said, it can't be, it can't be. You're too far away. Nobody could possibly reach us with that radio you have there. But uh, that, that was it. It made it. We were transmitting 25 miles on the, on a radio that would, had the range no more than five miles. But because of the size of the antenna and the fact that it was perpendicular to the line of transmission allowed us to get all those extra miles out of it. Of course, I would never have known that. <laughs> Harry, Harry knew it. He was, he, he was a, a soul. Oh, that, there's the girl there. Here she is as a, as a young girl. Oh, that's the one that yeah. on the next page. Yeah. That we, uh, Joe, Joe communicated her with, yeah, Edith, Edith Blumenstein. Yeah. But that, that was something. Oh, and now we're, now we're going into our reunions up in Maine. But uh, when you figure we went back 40 years later and found us those three places where we had been, mm -hmm. it was really something. Because I've done a lot of research in the last couple of weeks. Uh, this was written by Ed Plonsky. It's, the, uh, it's very good. It's the most authoritative uh, one I've read. There were other books put out, but uh, we found quite a few mistakes in some of the other books. But uh, here he shows the uh, tracing of the division from the time we got into combat and the time uh, we got out. Mm -hmm. uh, and this booklet I purchased at Remagen in 85 when we went back. Uh, men from the Division Association complained all through the 70s that they couldn't get anything in English when they went to the museum at Remagen. The mayor had requested that the army do something about this. And I don't know who he went through, but in the end, he had them reprint this. It's a reprint of chapter 11, a Rhine bridge at Remagen. And it's out of the, uh, 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 the original volume, The Last Offensive. It's part of a, a series of books that's uh, in the uh, uh, history, uh, the Office of the Chief of Military History in, in Washington, D.C. So he got them to put this out in, uh, in English so he could sell it there, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. And here's his letter of thanks. Uh, Hans Peter Kürten, Bürgermeister der Stadt Ramagan. So he sent in a, a letter of thanks for the army to, to do that. But uh, there was something, because here I have a, a ticket to the museum. So I don't think a camera could pick that up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, built the museum uh, in the towers that were left on the uh, east side, uh, at the west side of the Rhine. And uh, but this is probably one of the, the uh, most uh, accurate documentations of uh, of the crossing of uh, of the uh, the bridge and. Because a lot of people call it the, the Remagen Bridge, but mm -hmm. it really wasn't the Remagen yeah. Bridge, it was the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. Mm -hmm. But uh, in our last visit to Maine, we went to, to Joe's, and Joe now has built a, a little bridge over a culvert. 
<laughs> I get the bridges about eight feet long. But he put a big sign on it, Remagen. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's Joe Grimaldi, that's uh, Dave Sachs, that's uh, Joe Young, and that's me. And then, of course, with the three wives. But uh, I have to laugh at that because... Uh, can you get a picture yeah. of that? Yeah? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Oh, thank you very much for having me.